Mohammed, let's start with December instead of yesterday. Did Jenny Ellen blow it in December? No, she didn't. I think raising rates was the right thing to do in December. In fact, they should have done it earlier. I would have argued they should have done it in the spring. But what we are seeing is the Fed is no longer in control of its own destiny. You know, wow. Ask Fed officials, would they have liked to move the Dow by over 300 points after a statement is issued in which they do nothing at all? The answer is no. And yet they did because they're not able to communicate and maintain a clear policy message because they've become, they've become hostage to the rest of the world. Well, are they not communicating a clear policy message? Because I thought what they basically said yesterday was we'll hold. We're not going to move either way. We're going to hold. That's fairly consistent. And is it really their fault for not being consistent? Or is it because, as you say in your book, The Only Game in Town, people are fascinated with them because there's nothing else going on? So, David, it's not their fault. I mean, they've been pushed into a role that they don't really want. But think of it this way. A month earlier, they had told us that they expect four hikes. Now, we may get one or two. A month earlier, they had told us that there's a certain balance of risk in the economy. Now they're telling us they can't even comment on the balance of risk. So I think th the Fed is as confused as everybody else is, and that's because we're living in the midst of massive changes in liquidity, in volatility, and in the global economy. When you say the Fed can no longer control its own destiny, do you mean it's because they're out of ammunition? So first, they are out of ammunition, yes. That's, that's the first issue. Second is that because they've been the only game in town for so long, their policy effectiveness is getting exhausted. Thirdly, in okay, order... But, okay, how is that new? I feel like by the time we were on to QE a zillion, we were saying that. <laughs> well, and, and to be fair, Chairman Bernanke told us in August 2010, when he went unconventional with QE2, he said it's about benefits, costs, and risks. And the longer you stay unconventional, the lower the benefits, the higher the costs and risks. And that's what we're seeing today. Well, but go back to December, where they sort of gave guidance, more or less, with the dot plot and things. There would be f maybe four hikes this year. I mean, if they had said, no, they're not going to be four hikes, and then there were, then people would have been surprised. Right. They were trying to get us ready for that, trying to communicate it. I mean, do they have any choice? So what they're trying to do, which is right, is get us off this obsession of what are they going to do in January, what are they going to do in March. They want us to understand that this is going to be a very unusual hiking cycle. It's going to be very shallow, it's going to be stop-go, not the usual 25 basis points every meeting, and it's going to end way below where it's ended in the past. That's what they want us to focus on. But we keep on pushing them what are you going to do in January? What are you going to do in March? What are you going to do in 2016? Then is the only thing for the Fed to do to, to prevent this is to, is to simply step out and let the markets fall as they may? So fall as they may is, re is really an interesting comment because that means we are reliant on the Fed. Right? But, but that's what it is. If, you're, if the Fed is trying to push us to do one thing and we're saying, nope, what are you doing in January? What are you doing in March? Right. If their answer is... I'm saying and doing nothing, then what happens? So if they were to step back completely, then we're going to realize how much we have decoupled prices from fundamentals. Mm. And the difference has been central banks. So if they were to step up completely and say, you know what, we got, let me take a ridiculous example. We're going to continue hiking to 4%, as we have done historically. The market would have a heart attack. And they can't do that. They don't want to become part of the problem. They want to be part of the solution. But, but you're pointing to a fundamental problem, uh, which is, if, that, if you're right, I'm sure you are, that means a fair amount of the valuation in the market is actually anticipation of what the Fed's going to do, not about how corporations are doing, what their profits are, and whether people are making money or they're employed. Yeah, so I've put it differently in the book. I've said what the Fed has done, because that's the only thing it can do, it has borrowed growth from the future, it has borrowed financial returns from the future. Now, that makes sense if you can validate it by promoting economic growth. But the Fed cannot promote economic growth on its own. It needs the help of other policymakers. So what if the market had a heart attack? Yesterday when we were talking about Fed raising rates to Barry Diller, he thought about the Fed more at that moment than he said he ever has. David, before you sat in this seat, how much did you think about it? Never. Never. My, this wasn't relevant. So, so, so if the market has a heart attack, the market, who has been the prime recipient of all the goodness around QE because asset prices rose, what if the market had a heart attack? Why is that bad for the Fed? So the example I use is, you know, you have a BFF. You have a best friend forever. That's what the Fed was for the markets. 
and suddenly your BFF disappears. That's a problem. The Fed shouldn't be the BFF to a bunch of asset managers. So I completely agree with you, but the Fed had no choice. And you would have done the same thing, Stephanie, right? It had a moral obligation to step in when other policymakers could not. It, did never, it never assumed, and I don't think anybody else has, that it will still be in that business five years later. Well, that's a BFP, a big effing problem. <laughs> but, but, but so talk about the fundamentals, the underlying fundamentals. Are we headed toward recession? So I, I had put earlier the probability of a recession in 2016 at 30%, and people f felt that was really high. Now, you know, it's, the view is converging towards that. I think there is a possibility, a 30% possibility. Now, there's a 70% possibility we don't. I don't think a recession is likely for 2015. I think this economy is quite healthy. There's a ton of cash on the sideline. Right. There's a lot of innovation going on. I you, think you said for 2015, did you 20, 2016? 2016, 30 percent. 2015, I think, very low probability. Can you tell the difference between Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke? I mean, in terms of, po I mean, like, does it matter that much who's in the seat, or is it, po is it about po uh, monetary policy versus fiscal or political policy? I think it matters. I think the other thing we're going to see when the minutes come out is this is a less unified FOMC. Oh. I think in December, they were able to unify around a certain action and a certain message, but with what has happened subsequently, which was not their fault. Remember, China made some policy mistakes that have complicated everybody's life. Now we're going to see a much less unified Fed, and that matters when it comes to who's sitting in the chair.